So the question really becomes, how does this guy come out of nowhere and then break a record for a PSA 10 card set purchase, all first edition, Mm -hmm. and why? Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Collectors with Cards, Drinking Coffee. Today, uh, we have, I think, our our first guest that's, uh, I, you know, he's fairly new into the Pokemon scene, but I think from the collecting world, he has probably the best mindset or, or, or uh, business experience on the on the corporate end with all this stuff, and I'm looking forward to picking his brain a little bit on it and and uh, what has kind of dragged him into this Pokemon world. But uh, today we have uh, the wonderful Jeremy Padauer. How you doing, sir? <laughs> hey, man. It's so good to be here. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm excited. I was really happy that you asked me to come on today. Yeah, yeah, dude. I've, uh, you know, seen you quite uh, engaged in the, in the Instagram community lately, um, kind of starting around, you know, the, the pandemic time where we all got stuck at home, of course. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think the first instance of, of your name popping up was actually in E4. I saw your name uh, in E4. There was a pretty big purchase that you made uh, yes. and announced, which was the, the first edition base set, PSA 10 set, right? Yep, that's um, right. Uh, so I'm curious to, to, to learn your story a little bit here and, and, and yeah. see how we got to that point. So. So yeah. for those that don't know who you are, why don't you, you, you uh, yeah, introduce absolutely. yourself a little bit? So the question really becomes, how does this guy come out of nowhere and then break a record for a PSA 10 card set purchase, all first edition, mm-hmm. and why, right? Yeah. And I think I, can, I think I can answer that question during the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm Jeremy Padauer. I've, uh, I'm a toy maker. I've been in the toy industry for... 20 years. Um, I uh, co-owned a company called Wicked Cool Toys, and uh, Wicked Cool Toys was acquired in October of 2019 by a company called Allegheny Capital, which is a New York stock exchange company under the ticker symbol Y. And then we were paired with a company called Jazzwares. And then together, now um, I'm a partner at Jazzwares, which is one of the seven largest toy companies in the world. And when Wicked Cool Toys, when it was Wicked Cool Toys, um, I had previously managed the Pokemon license and the Pokemon toy business from 2006 with Black and White through, or Battle Frontier through 2012 at Jack Specific. I was an executive there, a top executive there. And uh, we started a toy company in 2015 or 16, which is about three or four years into the toy company. Um, I was uh, given the opportunity to pitch for Pokemon, and we did, and Pokemon liked the pitch so much that they invested in our company and granted us the global rights to Pokemon. Wow. So these things only happen with great relationships, and they only happen with great ideas. And I will tell you, one thing I've learned is that karma is 100% real. (laughs) And the reason why I say that is because nobody wants someone around if they've got bad deeds or they've got bad vibes. Mm -hmm. And what I always try to bring to the situation is good deeds, good vibes. And, you know, in business, that sometimes is hard. Uh, It's easy to be self-obsessed and and profit-focused. And that was never my thing. So when when we came back around in 2015 and uh, Pokemon made the investment, then Go hit. And uh, man, we were super much off to the races and ended up signing a lot of other great licenses um, like Micro Machines and Halo and AW and uh, my gosh, Coco Melon and some other wonderful ones. So yeah, yeah, top 10 toy company in the world, top seven actually. And, and, uh, and so armed with, you know, some success, I decided to, uh, to go even deeper than my 15 year relationship with Pokemon and start collecting <laughs> Pokemon. And, uh, and so that's, that's how that all began. Awesome. So <laughs> I'm really curious. I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know how much you can share, obviously, it, with all that, but um, with this conversation with Pokemon and, and 
them, I guess, or that I that 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 opportunity to pitch. How did that come to be? So, um, in two thousand and six, in two thousand and six or two thousand five, Hasbro had had the rights to Pokemon for about six years, mm-hmm. and um, the brand wasn't really a perennial brand yet. There was a card business that was doing well year to year, but other consumer products wasn't necessarily, you know, on on top. And, you know, Hasbro had not necessarily invested in, a lot in new action figures and in new toys around Pokemon. And the late 90s were such a phenomenon. Like most things in toys, the expectation is perhaps it's going to go away. So when I was an uh, executive at the, at the other toy company, I saw a great opportunity to go after the Pokemon brand. And we did. And in one year, we grew the toy business 600%. By investing in new development. Um, And I'm very happy and thankful that we did do that. Um, So I had established a great deal of trust with them. Um, So when we started our own business and when I came in and partnered in 2013, you know, we were very small. We we were we didn't exist, really. But by the time (laughs) they were pitching in 2015, um, I had the relationship with them and we had the ongoing company. Uh, to do something very unusual, which is to basically go in together and create the next big toy company. Wow. So, so it was, I mean, with, with knowing how strict Pokemon is with, with their IP, um, yeah. were, were the conversations just with the, the United States, the North America division, or were you, uh, uh, did you have to talk to guys in Japan as well? Or Yeah, no, uh, Mr. Ishihara himself, uh, was the final approval on the investment in our organization. Awesome. So, um, yeah, we had global rights outside of Asia. We still do. And um, at the time, you know, Pokemon became my business partner. And they, <laughs> and, or I should say our business partner, the, I, myself and my business partners, and then Pokemon. And we had um, a board member from Pokemon with their their chief uh, legal officer, mm-hmm. and we had a board ad- advisor, uh, which would switch between their chief financial officer and their chief marketing officer. So, so was, was that the goal right off the bat when you when you branched off to, to start this company with you and how many other people did, did you start yeah, with? Yeah, two. Myself, a guy named Thomas Poon in Hong Kong, and okay. a guy named Michael Rinsler here in the U.S., both toy veterans. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we started off, like anything, um, every... It's amazing how you can paint any picture you want looking backwards if you've been successful. <laughs> so if I wanted to be anything less than truthful with you right now, I would paint a beautiful rosy picture where everything was strategically laid out and we executed perfectly yeah. and we were geniuses, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not really the way it went down. The way it went down is our philosophy was, and Toys R Us existed, so it was, it was possible, that we wanted to get, we wanted to graduate from having like B-level licenses, but with A-level licensors. So, I'm sorry, B-level categories. So, for instance, we had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles right off the bat. We had had categories like wall walkers or novelties, like really inexpensive, high-margin toys for retail. We didn't have action figures. We didn't have plush. We didn't have, like, the sexy, meaningful categories. We had the secondary categories. And because we had so many good relationships, we were able to establish great, you know, establish our vendor numbers with all the major retailers, Walmart, Target, Toys R Us, etc. Toys R Us would take everything that we offered because it was high margin. And, um, and then we proved ourselves. And then over the course of a two or three years, we evolved from a company that had crappy categories with great licenses to having some of the best yeah. toy brands in the world. So was it now, with with Pokemon or even like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I mean, how many companies did they hand off their license uh, to? Was it were they very? Se- Not, I, I mean, of course they're selective, but yeah, was it like one and done, or were they? No, so like Turtles, like they they would have like a major licensee, which was Playmates, which mm-hmm. is still Playmates, and then they would have maybe a few additional partners to round out their line, okay. and um, so of course they would have like a high end. Uh, statue type partner they would have some low and and the way we kicked it off is we went low end i mean we mm-hmm. went we went to the stuff that was not necessarily difficult to manufacture um but it rounded out a line nicely and 
And while Walmart and Target were a little bit more hesitant to place some of this stuff, Toys R Us was, was open because they have a tremendous, or they had a tremendous amount of footage. Like, think, look at it this way. When you go to retail and you're at Walmart, Target, that sort of thing, there's a, the, the turns that they do, the amount of volume and velocity that they do is very, very high, like mm-hmm. significantly high. But the amount of space that they can allocate to any category is limited, mm-hmm. right? So if this is the space at Walmart or Target, this is the space at Toys R Us. They had a 40,000 square foot facility that they needed to fill with toys every year. Mm. So losing Toys R Us is terrible for the toy industry because it, it hurts new toy companies that want to try to jump in and be a participant. On the flip side, however, what has helped is direct-to-consumer has been amazing for newer toy companies. So there's some pretty remarkable companies that are popping up focused almost entirely on direct consumer and bypassing retail totally. Mm-hmm. And uh, it gets pretty interesting in that regard. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. That, you know, the, the, I, I love kind of the, the history of, of how things came to be. So, so understanding that a little bit, is pretty uh, uh, fun to, for me to hear at least. Um, so why, why did you chase Pokemon? I mean, like you said, Pokemon wasn't this, this beast in the industry like it is today, at least for toys, right? Um, and you said you saw you guys found that opportunity and took went for it, but well, and, and so in 2006, why is because you know the toy business is an interesting business, and then it's not really a it's not a rapid growth category, mm-hmm. okay? So like I have friends that own like app companies. And the whole app universe is growing at like 20, 30, 40% a year. The toy category, while it's meaningful and big, and it's like 70 or $80 billion globally, it's growing at like 1% a year, 2% a year. So every possible piece of business is cannibalistic on something else. So you're all fighting each other for this finite amount of potential business. And, um, To me, Pokemon was a really meaningful piece of business, like in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And I just thought, you know what? There's no way that this should just be so small. There's no way. I I believe that this should be bigger. And we invested in it back in the day. And again, like I said, it really established a lot of faith. And that's the reason why I would say, you know, 15 years later, you know, uh, we're in the position we are now. Yeah. But 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 that's why I went after it. I went after it because there's a finite amount of business to be had in toys. And uh, and it just it seemed so real to me. It just did not seem like that was one that should uh, that should be fading away. OK, well, before before we dive into to to Jeremy Padauer in 1999, I want to I want to jump before that, because your childhood was a little bit different than mine. You didn't have Pokemon growing up. Yeah. <laughs> what was. What was the first thing for you, if you remember as a kid, that, that uh, kind of started that collector momentum for you or, or that love of toys, I guess? So the love of toys and the love of collecting for value or collecting things because I liked the transactional part mm. were two separate things. Yeah. All right. So my love for toys um, are actually two brands I ended up managing. So one was Hot Wheels. Um, I loved Hot Wheels. As a little kid, I would just line them up all the way across the floor. I would spend hours coordinating a race uh, (laughs) to the other end of the hallway. And um, I had no preconceived notion as to which car would win the race. I mean, literally, I had no idea. But even today, if if given the opportunity, if someone gave me three cars, I could literally sit on the floor, turn my brain off. And uh, 15 minutes later, I'd be like, well, this car won. I'd have, I couldn't even begin to tell you why. <laughs> um, but I ended up uh, helping manage that brand later at Mattel in 2001. Um, but the other thing was uh, wrestling. So I was a big wrestling fan. I, I grew up in the South. I moved a lot. I moved eight times by the time I was 13, eight different oh. states. And um, so uh, wrestling was really cool. It was very regional at the time. And um, all of these bigger than life personalities would come through. So in 1983, I believe I was 10 years old. I'm 47 now, despite all the hair that I have in my head, which is not dyed, by the way. So I don't believe dyed. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so when I was 10 years old, man, uh, LJNs came on the scene, and I freaking loved them. So I bought as many as I could get from local Walmart uh, at that time in Mississippi. And um, I had the ring, and it was so fun, and it was great. And around that time, I also really started falling in love with the idea that some things might have secondary market value. And one of the things that had secondary market value that I was looking at and really loved was autographs. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting autographs and sports memorabilia, and I started writing letters to famous people and getting responses, uh, all the while playing with my wrestling figures and my Hot Wheels. And later on, I, uh, like I said, managed Hot Wheels and then became really well known for bringing back uh, wrestling toys yeah. 20 years. And, 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 okay. Yeah. And you're still doing that today from what I see. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I remember having like, uh, the, the actual like NASCARs, uh, cars. I had Jeff Gordon, Bobby Labonte, like yeah. those guys driving around and, um, definitely did those made up races in my head too. And don't remember why people won, but there was always like a favorite car that would get top three, but it would, it would mix up every now and then. It's possible that I made those because, um, when I was at Mattel, we managed the NASCAR license in 2001. And then when I was at Jax, we actually had the NASCAR license for a short period of time. Okay. And uh, so if in 2000 and how, how old are you? 27. I was born in 93. 27. So 93. So I would say it would be more likely that you played with the Hot Wheels stuff in the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, so there you go, man. You're playing with my toys, bro. Full circle. Thank you. I th thank you for, yeah, for providing those. Uh, <laughs> um, did you ever get to uh, go to any any cool wrestling uh, events? Did you see like Andre the Giant or, or uh, get to? As, as a kid, you know, because we lived in really small towns, it was not the big glitzy WWE stuff. It was more like Ric Flair coming into town with NWA. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the, the NWA and the AWA. Not NWA, the, the yeah. music, uh, that, which that, is also awesome. I love those guys. That but, was the first one no. that popped in my head. But yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. You're like, yeah, Ric Flair, man. Did you not know? He was part of the band. He was amazing. He was one of the, <laughs> the guys. No, um, no, the National Wrestling Alliance and mm -hmm. the American Wrestling Alliance, they were there were two like regional circuits that would come through like the, like literally with circus and they would, uh, and I was, you know, highly, highly inspired by that. I loved that. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I remember I would line myself up occasionally. Like, so when they come out of the curtains, I would snap a Polaroid. And <laughs> one time Ric Flair was coming through the curtains and I was like 11 and I snapped, I was positioned perfectly and I snapped a Polaroid and it blinded him and he threw his hands in front of him and pushed me down. And, um, and it was, uh, oh, I lost sorry you. about that. All good. Ah, you're back. <laughs> yep. I'm back. <laughs> and, and when that happened, um, it was a, a life changing experience. So Ric Flair, I'll just go back. Ric Flair came through the curtains. I flashed, it blinded him. I fell backwards and I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so, you know, my, my once, like, I guess, uh, uh, hero, I guess, who was Vince Carter. Uh, oh yeah, you know I amazing. He just retired, this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's been in. He's been playing too long. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember he, you know, I was going to the to Detroit Piston games all the time. I I I had connections there as well. Like my my JV basketball coach worked at the Piston, so he could get us good seats, get get there early, you know, get handshakes or whatever as they're coming on the court. And the day that Vince Carter came, the very first time, uh, he got ejected. In the second quarter, so I didn't get to see any cool Vinsanity dunks. And then the second time I went to go see him, it was at the end of the season. He wasn't playing, but I had an opportunity to like get a handshake, get a high five, and he just started playing with his watch on purpose. And <laughs> I was the only kid there, like looking for him, right? And <laughs> oh no! So I got I got disappointed by my uh, my Vince Carter experience, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's all right. Well, you know what? I think what you learn as you get older is that people only have so much that they can possibly give. Yeah. And at some point in time, they have to disappoint somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just happen to be that kid in that moment. <laughs> That's I mean, all right. I, actually, I still love you, Vince. <laughs> yeah, right. And I like for me, like, I, you know, I'm not exceptionally well known, but I've got about 100,000 followers on social media. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely impossible for me to keep up with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. I mean, I... 
I try to answer, I look, I try to spot things that are meaningful. I certainly can't do anything customer service oriented on behalf of the company, um, but it's hard. So I imagine when you take that about 16 levels up and you're globally known and, you know, tens of millions of people love you, mm -hmm. um, it's a totally different experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. I mean, yeah, e even me, like, you know, 6,000 followers on, on Instagram right now and the amount of messages and comments you get from just doing like podcasts like this is it's a lot to handle and you know it takes a lot of time out of your day so you you got to be able to manage that and can't answer them all um absolutely so fully, absolutely fully understand think, that and i think people understand that when they're adults or most adults do mm -hmm. but to kids it's earth shattering yeah and uh <laughs> i can see i can see how being a kid you're in that situation you're just like oh man life is not what i expected <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly mind, you're like vince is gonna He's going to help hold me up so I can dunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that's, that's all right. I picked up a few of his rookie cards in, in a, a sealed box of, uh, of that set, too. So I'm, I'm still all in on Vince. He's, he's my guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, seems like, he seems like he's a, a great dude. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about Pokemon a little bit in, in 1999. Um, what, what, what was your story? You know, most of my... My guests that I have on here are are uh, uh, my my colleagues and friends that I've that I've <laughs> <laughs> younger that I've gone yeah. through you know the past five six years with. We're all kind of very similar stories of of Pokemon, but I don't get the opportunity to hear from someone who um, was really involved in in the toy industry at, at that, but also yeah. more conscious of conscious of uh, what was happening. Well, at that I'll time. tell you what my and I don't mind saying this out loud and. And because uh, I would say it to anybody at Pokemon, uh, it was around 2000, um, 1999. It was right. It was right before all everything blew up. Hmm. And I was in the Warner Brothers lobby waiting for a meeting. And um, there was something on TV, and I was these characters, and they were jumping around, and I was just like, and I looked at my buddy, and I was said. I said, I don't think that's ever going to work. I was like, I don't even know what, what is that? I don't know. I was like, who buys that? Mm -hmm. Obviously a couple months later. Now I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know the backstory. I didn't know the nuance. I didn't know anything. So I, I cut myself a break for being honest. Um, but then a couple months later, it becomes the biggest thing ever really. And, uh, I, just, you know, watched a couple episodes, opened up a couple packs. And I was like, this is, this is going to change things. This is like a big deal. Hmm. Um, but I still, it was still many years. It was still six years before I became involved. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, but my, my, my thought process was, oh my gosh, here's a brand that didn't exist a year ago. And this year it's doing like a billion dollars at retail and toys. That's wild. That is like it, it happened with Cabbage Patch Kids, mm -hmm. like in the '80s. Um, it doesn't happen very often. Phenomenons are few and far between. Yeah, wow. So, so back back in in '99, uh, you were were you working at Warner Brothers? Were you, this was when you were an executive at. Uh... So in '99, I was um, so I was in I was in finishing up graduate school. I did a JD MBA. I, I did way too much school, and I'll explain <laughs> that in a moment. Uh, but I was doing a um, I was doing a internship at NBC mm -hmm. over a five month extended period. I had summer plus I had the first semester to do it, and I think I was sneaking away to do some interviewing, um, and I just happened to be in the Warner Brothers lobby at that time. Gotcha. And uh, but interestingly enough, so my my um, I was in college. For a long time, my friend, I, I did uh, I did four years of college and five years of grad school. Um, but but the reason why, and I paid for my own education. This mm -hmm. wasn't like uh, someone was there helping me out uh, mm -hmm. significantly. Um, although my my parents did help me pick up the first couple of years. Um, I had figured out a scheme, basically, uh, online in 1995 1996 to game Yahoo. Yahoo was a pretty early search engine, right? And really it was just a phone book. Uh, there was no algorithm. 
-hmm. So if you listed your sites with two A's in any category, you would show up first. So I focused on toys. I liked Beanie Babies and Furby and this and that. And I had like 10 or 11 or 12 of these. And I realized that I could have crappiest content in the world. My HTML stunk. My source code stunk. Nothing was good. But it was first. Mm -hmm. And because it was first, I went from having zero views to like 15, 20,000 people a day. And I was benefiting from advertising. So as long as I had this going on, and then I bought domain names. I had act.com and uninsured.com and all these great names that I bought for next to nothing and sold for a lot. Hmm. And what I'm saying to you is, it just, because I was having student loans and because I liked school and it was a great way for me to avoid life, um, I was highly incentivized to stay in school as long as humanly possible. <laughs> I'd just be an average student. <laughs> And, uh, and I did really well. So I had a, a very successful uh, one-person internet company that uh, was a hustling, hustling company. And that's how I got to Mattel after, wow. after grad school. What are you doing five years of grad school for? I've been thinking about, or I was thinking about getting an MBA. And yeah. that's just the way Pokemon's going. It just makes no sense to take time away from it. So, um, Well, I'll tell you. So I did, I... You can do a JD MBA and it's a four year program oh, okay. generally. However, I did it the long way. Mm -hmm. I did a three year law school and then I did two years of business school. Gotcha. All the while working on entrepreneurial ventures that were paying for all of it and allowing me to put some money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I put off and I postponed life by doing that. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've, yeah, I've, I kind of had that same thought of, you know, I did uh, a few years, five years or so in the regular corporate world and doing sales and I was getting ready to go, go get an MBA and uh, Pokemon just kind of took over, it blew up obviously last year and it's still on the horizon of wanting to, to go back and get more schooling. But uh, yeah, right now it's, this deserves all my focus and I know it's the right opportunity to well, do that. It seems like you're doing really well. And, and what I would say to you is um, it really does make for a very interesting story for business school. And yeah. there's only, to me, with business school, there's two types of business schools to go to. Either go to one of the best in the country or go to one that doesn't cost very much at all. Mm -hmm. Don't do anything in between. Mm -hmm. Don't go to a okay business school that costs $60,000 a year. Right. Uh, that's the no man's land that can land you into a uh, bad return on investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's what I picked up, uh, you know, talking to some mentors about that as well. So that's, that's another, another one to, to add onto that list to, to go with that. Uh, yeah. Cause I was looking at, at Stanford, Harvard, U of M, um, you know, top 10, the M seven schools. So perfect. Um, and, and the return on investment is very legit mm -hmm. in those types of schools. Yeah. But obviously very extremely legit. competitive. So, it was either yeah. that or, or yeah, like you said, uh, go out the cheaper option. And most things are online anyway. And, and yeah. uh, you know, the big thing with, with school and, and the big thing that I appreciate and do now is obviously networking, is relationship yes. building. You know, I, I pride myself on the, basically my collection of, of, of relationships that I create. That's what I love to do. And um, it, it, the, the, whole, the whole online school, spending that kind of money on an MBA Feel like you i really want to do it in person have that experience so um although it's kind of a good time to be applying because people aren't doing it but uh yeah it's, I mean, it's a mix look, of emotions it, man <laughs> it all comes down to um why you're doing it and and whether you can continue to do what you're doing on the side mm -hmm. which i would say i think you can so i i was always under the thought process that Get like, I've never. I mean, I've hired a lot of people. I've never once asked what their grades were. Mm -hmm. um, not once. I don't really care. What yeah. I care about is who they are, what do they learn, and what do they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, thought is, if you do walk into a less competitive space this year, uh, and you can sort of backdoor into a Harvard or something like that. Because you also have a really cool background and an interesting background in the, in the five years in the business sector as well. Um, you do it. Yeah. You just do it. Yeah. And you don't have to be at the top of your class. 
You don't even have to be in the middle of your class. Um, and if you've got a good hustle going on from a business perspective, um, what really matters is what is your financial condition coming out? Right. Um, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, uh, that idea is still there and still, still have that motivation to go do it. But yeah, this, this whole side hustle has turned into to a main hustle. So it's been, it's been <laughs> yeah, interesting yeah. to, to manage, you know, figuring out all this and taking on all the extra content creation now. And, um, although that's not very financially, uh, uh, responsible on my end. It's just, it's fun. That's investing. I, exactly. That's an investment. Yeah. That's an investment in your, in your passion. Mm -hmm. And that's an investment. That's like putting money away in a, in a 401k that one day you look at it and you're like, Oh, <laughs> that, that actually added up to something. Yeah, exactly. So, which by the way, that does add up to something over time. Yeah. It definitely does. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm just enjoying it, man. Having a great time. Um, so let's talk about your, your collector mentality then. I mean, it sounds like, you know, building up, these successful businesses obviously requires a lot of time um, I mean, during this, that, that build up in, in I guess, success train that you started riding. Was there time to start collecting? Were you collecting at all no. during those early years? No, I wasn't. Yeah. I was 100% focused on the business. Mm -hmm. I was 100% focused on my career. Um, it, after we sold the company, and, uh, and again, stayed on for the leadership team and stayed on as a partner. But um, it, it changed my mentality. Like, A, I felt like I had a message that I could share with other people that following the things that you were passionate about can really lead to a great outcome. Uh, B, it's amazing what that does for your self-confidence uh, after you have a successful business venture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, and I've always been a good storyteller. And so um, the idea of all of that coming together for me, communicating to people that they should at least diversify a little bit uh, their investments into things that they're passionate about and collectibles, and also diversify their time professionally and dedicate a little bit of time into things that they're interested in and professionally excited about. So. For instance, um, people say, you know, oh, man, I wish I had a toy store. And I'm like, yeah, you, you can't have a toy store. Here's how you can have a toy store. Go take $1,000, um, go to flea markets, go to garage sales, go to everything post-COVID. Don't go get COVID right now. <laughs> right. Uh, or maybe go in a hazmat suit and go get this stuff now because it's less competitive. <laughs> um, and open up an eBay store and manage it and spend 45 minutes a day and two hours on the weekends servicing 10 orders a week. You own a toy store. Congratulations. Even though 95% of your time you're um, doing working for the man or dealing with something that there's a hierarchy and it's maybe not your favorite thing, you're dedicating 5% of your time to being your own person. And let me tell you, it does amazing things for your spirit. So everyone today can own their own little business. Everyone today can have their own little place. And no matter what else it is that they're doing. Yeah, I like that. I mean, it's yeah, this. I mean, for a lot of us, especially in the Pokemon world, it just that's exactly what it was. We took took a thousand dollars, took five hundred dollars and bought some cards and it just grew and grew and grew and turned into this monster. Um, it did. And uh yeah it's it's created so many opportunities for so many different people right you know giving me the opportunity to, to leave that nine to five and and do my own thing it's just it's phenomenal what's happening i love it I, I mean it's hard not to love it so um once you once you sold your company um it had some extra pocket change what was the yep. first thing that you bought on a, um, other than maybe a really, like a house or a car, like a collector, a no, collection oh, piece, right, right. a collection so we'll piece. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the, I'd say the first big asset purchase was um, I spent one hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars on an all PSA ten first edition Pokemon set. And um, what brought you there? Well, um, I wanted. Um, I always wanted it. I've watched, I'd watch it go up in value year after year. Um, when, I, when I started with Pokemon, 
um, you know, I could, I don't even know if one existed, but I do know that graded cards were already in vogue and um, there were some graded cards and I th- I watched it throughout the years and I watched Charizard go from, you know, $1,800 to $3,500 to $10,000 to $60,000. And I was like, you know what? These kids are 25 to 30 years old right now. And what's going to happen in 10 years when they're 40? I'm going to regret this if I don't dive into this because I know what's going to happen because I can see the future now because I'm older. Let me tell you something that happens, okay? The reason why grandma sits there like Yoda and says things that sound somewhat possibly uh, like she's like somehow a, a wizard that knows the future because she does know the future. She's seen it happen. <laughs> All of these lives and all these people that are floating around, we've all, it's, it's, it's a game that's been played over and over again. And when you live longer, you see it out. So in my mind, I knew very well that at some point in time, these 30-year-old kids become 40-year-olds. And when they're 40, they have more access to capital. They have more proximity to capital. They have more influence over capital. And um, that plus the fact that I have a particular passion for Pokemon and I love collectibles and I love investing in collectibles um, led me down the path. And I was like, you know what, this is going to be the easiest hundred thousand dollar purchase I've ever made. And, you know, 18 months later or whatever it is, it's a, you know, $650,000 item. Yeah. So, no, I love, or whatever. Yeah, I love that that thread that you made the track the prices of all of it. I think that's oh, thank and you. that's that's one of the most like successful threads that we've ever seen on E4. Uh, <laughs> so that, that well, that's really nice. I, I the reason another thing that I recognized when I did buy that set as I was looking at the prices of the individual cards and I was like it's not a $129,000 set, it's a $250,000 set right this second. Mm-hmm. But nobody's nobody's showing this tracking. And then I realized, well, there are people that are showing it, but they're not necessarily displaying it in a very, very straightforward, easy way. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone's like, yeah, you know what? I'll spend a little bit of time educating. And yeah. I think that was very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, with, with the Logan Paul stuff and, uh, you know, after that and, and all the other celebrities buying, at least the Charizard, um, yeah, you know, it dragged a lot of people out to sell that set, and having that that uh, place to go to to really figure out true value on something as historic as that made it made it really really easy for people to to move things around, make that purchase, make that sale. Um, Definitely, so that was good. Um, what? Yeah, and what I suspect is going to happen now um, is that the the PSA ten first edition Charizard is a great card it's amazing card the first edition set's amazing but i think like knowing human behavior um and just knowing the way people work people that collect like scarcity Mm -hmm. they like relevance they like vintage they like the idea that you can't have a million other things graded and show up on the scene so that's why i really got so involved with collecting all things charizard and pikachu Mm pre-2000 Um, so I think I've put together like the premier high grade collection, um, pre 2000, because I think like, I I think that all of these one of 20 PSA tens, one of 10, one of 17, one of 25, like those things are really significant historically. And, and you've seen that in the sports card business. And I think you'll see that in Pokemon. Yeah. I mean, the, the items that you, you went after pretty quick. I mean, they're they're unique. Always can have been considered niche. Um, the you know the original Japanese releases, Cardass and Band or you know Bandai and uh, Top Sun. Um, are are you scared at all of the fact that we don't have nostalgia towards that stuff because we didn't know it existed until however many years later? Yeah, I know. You know, it's, the thing about nostalgia is nostalgia is a living, breathing thing. So while you don't have nostalgia for it because you, when you were eight, it w- didn't mean as much, there's still a whole group of people who are eight right now who are seeing this bigger picture and they're learning about it. Mm-hmm. And part of what they're learning about is the fact that there was a 1996 set and that there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened prior to 1999. In the meantime, I think that the entire community has awakened 
to the fact that Top Sun existed and that there's some interesting Top Sun cards and that uh, and that the Japanese set is the OG set and all of this stuff. I've seen a real massive change of attitude in the last year, and you can see it in the values. Mm -hmm. And remember, because nostalgia is living and breathing, that becomes nostalgic very, very quickly. Yeah. And let me tell you, sometimes quicker than you can react. So my whole philosophy and what I believe is that in a blink, uh, some of these things, Top Sun, the Japanese uh, 96 set, um, really all things Charizard and Pikachu graded and starters secondarily, um, hollows, like these things are going to be uh, fantastically more valuable um, 10 years from now, in my opinion, in my opinion. <laughs> of course, yeah. We, we never know what's going to happen. I mean, obviously no one saw this coming in 2020 and and i mean the, the the fear of mine is is did we just get there too fast i mean we 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 definitely there was no no um well there's two things okay number one the valuation wasn't reflected accurately right that that first edition set wasn't one hundred and twenty nine thousand mm dollars. -hmm. The set didn't go from one hundred and twenty nine to six fifty in a year. I identified an opportunity of something that was being sold very significantly under value because no one was tracking it appropriately. Mm -hmm. So I think that Pokemon cards, many of them have gone up two times that are in that core nostalgic category. Um, Obviously, there's some some outliers mm -hmm. that have gone up a lot more. Um, and if you do look at like some of the Japanese cards, the awareness has exploded, and therefore they're more valuable. But I I would say that to say that it really went from 129 to 650 just because I made an acquisition at that level, you know, look, maybe occasionally you just find somebody that makes a good acquisition, and it doesn't reflect the true value. So. I mean, like I said, I put the numbers together and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a 200 and something thousand dollar set mm -hmm. today. And, uh, and look, I was right. I've been wrong a lot too. <laughs> so, uh, and specifically I've been wrong a lot in business. So I'm not here to say that I'm, you know, have an amazing insight better than anybody else. Uh, but what I do have is I have access because I've had some success in mm -hmm. my career. I'm older. I've seen more and I am willing to lose money because I trust my instincts and those types of things are helpful. They, you know, they, they lead you down a path where you don't worry as much. Yeah. So that's interesting. You, you kind of did this on your own accord. You didn't have any, I mean, did you find people on YouTube like S and Pratt talking about Pokemon? Did you reach out to these guys? Did you, it's, it, I mean, you kind of make it sound like you, pick this up yourself and i mean obviously you, you were aware of pokemon and very aware of its ip yeah. and how well it does um so that very well could be the case but what did you have friends you're doing with this with too or no. it, was it just like hey i'm gonna no. buy pokemon cards no you know i i've spent a lot of time in my life co uh, creating collectible systems studying hmm. collectible systems um i'm a very quick study on a system of collectability okay so um I started with the first edition because that was something I aspired to have. And then I was, then I looked for opportunities and I, and I'm a business person, right? So I'm very strategic and I identified five key opportunities that I wanted to be involved with. And I can just throw, throw them out there. If you're number one. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. I'm, I am an open book. Like here's the way I look at, and the other way, I, look, I look at life this way. Like I have no interest in, in having a whole grape if I can have half of a watermelon. And what I mean by that is if I can share information, give away a lot of opportunities, what I have gets much bigger, mm -hmm. even if I don't get to have the whole thing. Right. I, I have no interest in having the whole thing of anything. That's why I had business partners. I find that I, find that I am not, uh, you know, going to be able to do anything in life by myself. That's not really, I'm not a frontiersman. I'm not going to go out and build a log cabin. Gotcha. <laughs> but so here are the five categories, right? So for me, it was the first edition set and the first edition cards. Okay. It was the trainer deck A and B because when I looked into it, what I recognized was how a rare 
be undervalued and unusual those cards were and what they meant, right? Those cards were sent to shops to educate kids on how to play Pokemon. Mm -hmm. They were beat up and thrashed. They were beat to heck, right? These cards were destroyed. So the fact is there's only a very few PSA 10s of any of these. So I focused a lot of time and effort into that. Um, the 1996 uh, Japanese style cards, mm -hmm. I was all over um, and learned a lot about no rarity symbol. And, and that was very cool. Mm -hmm. 95 top sun, honestly got interested because it said 95. Yeah. And what I've come to recognize and, and I can tell you through all kinds of conversations internally is that the 95 top sun is an interesting one because there's something about the copyright that is real. And then there's things about the manufacturing date that are real. Yep. It may be that it was the first deal, but it wasn't necessarily the first cards that hit the street. Right. So the deal could have been done like early, early, early. Um, so there's truth to it. And then there's weirdness to it. Yeah. Right? We, we, I don't think we know 100%, but that one is speculated to, be, to have been released in 97. So that the 96 uh, set was the first to hit the street, like you said. But that's still not even... It's And I can't even get an absolute... I'm going to one day get an absolute definitive answer on this as okay. to why. But, um, but I, think, I think what we can say is that Top Sun deal may have been the first deal. Mm. Um, and there may be some licensing things that happen when you make a deal at a certain time where you have to communicate that deal. Gotcha. Um, was yeah. done at a certain time and that's hmm. and that goes beyond manufacturing dates right so copyright whatever and then you know honestly it was very early in the pokemon life cycle mm -hmm. and so who knows how that was managed but regardless so uh 95 top sun 96 japanese old school uh the trainer deck a and b the first edition and then really the fifth thing is anything and everything high grade charizard and pikachu pre-2000 and that was my investment strategy and mm -hmm. I've stayed with it and, you know, and it's been a very successful strategy for me. Now, I mean, based on, you know, following you and, and watching your journey of, of your collection with Pokemon, it seems like you're getting pretty close to finishing that. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, what would come next then in, in the Pokemon world? Well, I mean, for me, I would say that um, is any collection ever truly finished? I mean, <laughs> Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I've communicated the things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I continue to buy into those areas. Um, there's certain things that have been very, very difficult. It took me over a year to finish the top sun hollows, mm -hmm. um, to put together that set of 16 cards was gnarly. I will tell you it was, it was a global, I think, I think, uh, what are there? Seven continents. Yeah. I think these cards came from five. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's pretty so, awesome <laughs> it's really awesome yeah. yeah they came from everywhere latin america um europe australia um certainly north america and i know there's a fifth um and it may it's somewhere in asia yeah, yeah. somewhere in asia so there were five continents uh uh -huh. reflected yeah um and i have things like that that i'm still mm -hmm. you know i mean i would I would like to say that I could pick up a PSA 10 no rarity symbol Charizard, mm. but, uh, but I'm not sure that $500,000 is burning a hole in my pocket that I, <laughs> that I really want to do that tomorrow. But yeah. I'm, I'm glad to say that, you know, that my opinion has probably made a difference in the value of that card. And I think my opinions made a difference in the value of the top sun uh, PSA 10 Charizard that's being sold right now. How do you feel about that? Um, I think it's a freaking incredible card. How, well, I, how, how, well, no. How, how yeah. do you feel about the responsibility that you're that you kind of taken on right there? I mean, you know, it's of course the industry like collectibles is is there's a lot of gray area, right? That's yeah. in, in discussions and how people feel about what people say and not knowing true intentions, right? Um, yeah, and. and Obviously, you're an open book. That's how you portray yourself, and, and, which is great. I like to portray myself as an open book as well, and I think it's the yeah. best way to go about life because, like you said, sharing information with everybody is important, helps each other grow. So yeah. how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Have you really sat back and thought, like, is this my 
the conversation that I've started and and the numbers that you you put out there, um, do you feel like you hold a responsibility to the prices rising up and maybe hitting a point that might not make sense or, or how do you feel about all that? Yeah, I mean, well, I'll just tell you this. What I said when I invested was that I'm, I'm going for a 10 times return in 10 years. Hmm. Um, and I still believe that I, that's, that was my objective, a 10 times return in 10 years. If it's up five times in one year, that's nothing I ever communicated would ever happen to anybody. <laughs> right. Um, and so, um, I don't know. I mean, I know that the demand went way, way up. The demand's a lot higher than I would have ever anticipated. Mm -hmm. The supply on the vintage stuff is very low. Um, I feel very confident in my personal investment over time. Um, I think everything that's gone up very quickly has a tendency to settle in at a new pricing sector. Mm -hmm. um, it's just normal. It happens to every market. You know, the responsibility that I feel is you know, did I personally walk the walk? And the answer is yes. Did I sell out at the highest point? No, I haven't sold a single card. Um, so if I had, if my objective or if my behavior was, you know, rah, 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 sell, bye, bye yeah. everybody. Great to see you. But no, I mean, like, I'm serious. Like 10 years from now, let's have a conversation. Um, maybe when I'm in my late fifties, because I'm getting older and it's, it gets a little bit challenging to think about bequeathing things. And, you know, you have to start to liquidate yourself. I mean, really in your sixties, what I find is a lot of collectors start liquidating hmm. because they feel like it's a better thing for their family and it's more healthy for their kids mm -hmm. if things are clean. And, you know, look, I'm very open about life. I mean, we're here temporarily. I mean, right. you know, if I get 80 years, that would be amazing. But if I get 80 years, it means that I'm 60% of the way through today. <laughs> wow. Hey, <laughs> so, hate looking at it that way. Yeah. Yeah, but it's okay, yeah. man. Right, it's right. totally okay. It's like I'm good. I'm good with it. So right. what I'm saying to you is I walk the walk. I haven't sold anything. Mm -hmm. I might sell a Jordan card at some point, but that has nothing <laughs> to do with Pokemon. Yeah. And uh, you know, 10 years from now I might sell some. 20 years from now, I'll probably sell more. Yeah. And um, and I do expect that prices will be buoyant. 10 years from now, mm -hmm. people are going to be 40. They're 30 yeah. kids. I'm telling you right now, you go to the mall and walk around and tell me how many 25 year olds really have any money. It's rare. Yeah. And yet the price of these things have gone up. So mm -hmm. wait 15 years and, and yeah. see where no, these people yeah, are. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you can't, it, 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 all vintage things, they're, they're not all limited. You know, there's quite a, a, an abundance of certain limited or a, a vintage uh, product, but like, like you mentioned the stuff that you're buying. I would agree is is quite limited and and it it shows by the pop report and the prices and uh, and all that. So yeah, it's it's a interesting uh, uh, conversation because you know a lot of people get uh, you know jealousy and greed and all this stuff comes into their head when they're watching um, these people talk about their passions, whether it's sports cards, um, Pokemon or or Dragon Ball Z, like I do and. And it can yep. it can shift the market, and, and it's. By the people, way, I managed the Dragon Ball Z business for two years. Stop, dude. That's like yeah. Dragon the Ball Z is here. Pokemon at is, Jax. At really? Jax. That was part of my. That was part of my. Uh, wow. That was part of my purview. I'll show you a, uh, a one of a hundred, um, figure that I don't know if you've ever seen before that we did at Toy Fair in two thousand and five. Got that. I have in my toy box. I'll I'll show you in a bit. Got to see that. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, but uh, but on that note, uh, here's the way I look at it, okay? I felt jealous towards successful people m m when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I did. As I got older and I recognized the type of risks that one takes to become successful financially, I was less jealous because I knew that either they were crazy <laughs> for taking some crazy risks mm -hmm. um, they didn't, or they didn't care about other people and they just sort of went forward. Um, and I recognized if, if this company hadn't been successful, I'd have been truly happy going back and working for other people. Um, there's only so many, there's only so many times you can take huge risks um, and feel good about it. And there's an age at which it makes less sense. Like when I was 39, being involved with the startup, it made more sense than being 47. And I promise you at 55, 
it makes less sense. Now, <laughs> it doesn't mean you can't. And by the way, you're way smarter at 55, dude, way. Um, and you know what to do and what not to do. But, you know, there's the truth is that you also don't necessarily want to start over mm -hmm. if all hell breaks loose. So jealousy um, is age specific. The older you get, the more you appreciate other people mm -hmm. and their success uh, because you know or you have a really good sense as to what it takes. Now, some people have it dumped upon them, but let me tell you, that's far more rare than the people that slug it out like me, hustle every day, mm -hmm. try to do it the right way, try to be kind and, and, and earnest. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you're going to feel jealousy towards that, what I would say is um, that's okay, but age will take care of a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think Drake said in one of his songs, jealousy is just love and hate at the same time. So uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a balance. And yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, a, a huge learning curve as, as you get to know people and um, get to understand how, how they got to where they are. That's, that's my favorite thing about this. It's just learning the stories of people and, and being able to compare one walk of life to another and get the similarities and the differences and just learn as much as possible. So it's really yeah. cool. Um, Here's the way I look at jealousy, okay? Yeah. You want to be jealous about something with me? Be jealous about my hair. <laughs> I did nothing to deserve this phenomenal <laughs> head of hair. Nothing. I was just born. I'm 47. I don't even need gray hair, Gosh, okay? I hope I have now, hair like that when I'm 47. That's awesome. Now, it's awesome. It, it's, it extended my youth, mm -hmm. okay? But don't be jealous of the stuff that I worked my ass off for. Mm -hmm. Be jealous of my hair. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I was born <laughs> with it. Now, my face is a whole other topic. No I, one's jealous of that. I'm, I'm really hoping <laughs> I get the, uh, the salt and pepper look when I get older. I love that look, and that's, that's something that you know, I don't think you can, you can make on your own. So I'm hoping I <laughs> no, get that. No, you can't. You can't. I, 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 I'm looking forward to that myself. That, that George Clooney salt and pepper look is yeah. key. Um, so one thing that I actually picked up from you um, was, I mean, so I've, I've always been in the sports, huge basketball player, uh, played at Michigan State for a very short time for Tom Izzo. And, oh, cool. Um, ended up playing wow. with, the, with, with the women's team, actually, for the majority of my time there because I got, I got cut and that was more enjoyable. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so uh, I, you know, I, I have this temptation still to buy sports cards and, and it's, you know, I've got the Vince Carters, I've got... Um, a couple other you know, modern stuff as well that I had fun opening, but um, you, you brought up golf. You, you took oh, out these, yeah. these Jack Nicholas cards. Yeah. And I regret to say that I didn't buy one the second that you, that you posted it. And I, I, I looked it up. I was about to, I was ready to buy every single one on eBay and I just, I didn't pull the trigger, but instead I bought a case of the upper deck 2001. Um, Tiger Woods set, basically, right? Oh my God, that is unbelievable! So what happened? I ripped it open all, but I bought it at what five hundred, five fifty for the case. They're up to three, four, five thousand dollars now. I don't know what. I sent in a hundred and fifteen Tiger Woods cards to PSA. I hope I get them back soon. But it, 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 here's the thing, though. I opened Holy up all twelve boxes. I pulled five of the base rookies. That's it. Only five. Wow. And I got, you know, all the Tiger Tails, some of the other insert Tiger Woods. So I'm really excited to see how that turns out. I'll probably get upcharged like crazy now because the prices have like 10 X. Um, but Whoa, that is awesome, man. I love that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, think about, think about that for a moment. A, there's one, there's a few things that, you know, and I'm, in manufacturing so mm -hmm. i have an, an innate sense for this it's golf okay mm -hmm. so at the very inception of this you know that they did not manufacture the type or the number of cards that they would manufacture in a traditional set mm -hmm. baseball football basketball even hockey like when they're looking at their brand pnl they're like okay we got to replace this volume for football. And then they get to the very bottom and they're like, okay, we have this much for golf. Yeah. There's, there's no expectation. There's no business necessity to create a lot of the golf cards. Mm -hmm. So those cards start rare and then no one cares about them. And then once people start caring about them, 
the rarity and the scarcity is just off the charts. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. And by the way, like the 82 and 81 boxes, mm -hmm. those cards are awful when you open them up. The mm -hmm. centering is terrible. They suck. Yeah, you opened some and of I, those, didn't you? I did. I did. I opened a little bit of them, but for the most part, I just I keep them sealed. And uh, mm -hmm. but my my Jack collection is awesome, and I'm going to talk more about it soon, mm -hmm. um, and just kind of go through each one. But my whole philosophy on Jack is much like my philosophy on Pokemon, which is I wanted the vintage stuff, the rare, scarce stuff, and I think I put together. I know one other guy that pretty much has, you know, everything from 1971 to 1985 hmm. for Jack. And that's what I, that's what I focused on. Okay. Yeah. I think that that's a really, really smart purchase, especially now that uh, upper deck, is it upper deck or tops? It's <clears throat> coming out with the set this year. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. They, great. Yeah. They're doing, of course, getting back into, these high-end sets with the one-of-ones, the patches, yeah, and all that stuff. I think there's going to be a few golf sets this year, so that'll be interesting to see um, moving forward with what happens with golf. But um, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be very impressive. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's interesting because modern cards and specifically modern sports cards, they manufacture collectability. Mm -hmm. Pokemon has never really manufactured collectability. You know, they've never done like here's the the you know um refractor and here's the one of 10 refractor and then mm -hmm. here's the one of one refractor I mean, it's a great way to um to have meaningful value and chase and rarity um it's a proven system uh but uh but it also you know if they breach the trust and i hope they never do um it can really co collapse i mean do you, you kind of do that with um your your wrestling toys don't you oh for sure for yeah sure. what's that what's that like i mean so i mean my philosophy has always been that um if you have rarity and you have chase mm -hmm. then you create interest in people who are not just your core collector you also create interest amongst you know, people that collect teddy bears, but they want to maybe have something of interest. And it brings mm -hmm. people into the brand that otherwise wouldn't be there. So, right. yeah, no, honestly, I've been doing, I've been manufacturing collectability for almost my entire career. Okay. So, like, the, well, the, the figures that you do, um, the, action, yep. the action figures, right? They are, are they all, I guess, of the same availability? Or do you have, like, you have one of ones? Do you have? Yeah. Yeah, really, I mean, not really one of ones. I'll do like one of 500s or one of 1,000 or one of 3,000. How does that get dispersed? Of, Is that, I mean, because you sell in big box stores, right? Yeah, Target, Walmart, so Amazon, everywhere. That's trusting the stock people. That's trusting It is those it is. to put it out on the shelf and not keep it for themselves or call their friend and say, hey, this came in, come buy it. it I hit it, it behind the teddy bears is. in aisle seven. Like, <laughs> well, and you know, the truth is that um, a lot of it does find the end consumer. And then, oh, hold on. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> the, tr the truth is that a, a lot of it does find the end consumer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And some of it along the way ends up in uh, retail hands or, or um, hands of, of stock people or whatever. And those are things that you just can't necessarily control but for the most part i think it's very diplomatic uh, very uh d democratized the way okay. it's it's executed okay yeah because yeah with pokemon and, and the super high demand right now it's just people complaining scalper 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 we can't get any boxes yeah. even though the people complaining are the ones doing the same thing so um but i do feel bad you know obviously for the the kids of the parents who are truly looking to get it for them to enjoy. Um, yeah, it's listen, you know, one of the biggest issues that I saw in 1985, 1986, 1987 was the card companies overreacted to the demand mm -hmm. and they over manufactured to make sure they captured every little piece of demand and that flooded the market and it created a disaster. Yeah. And 
as hard as it is to stomach, um, it's way better to have stockouts yeah. than it is to have um, free flow of goods mm -hmm. every time. Um, it's aggravating, but it's really, really good for long term. Yeah, it, it, it creates that nostalgic moment, like hidden fates from last year or 2019. I think that was probably, probably going to be the most popular set modern set moving forward because of that story of that was kind of the first Pokemon that set in the modern times that was just like unavailable to everybody. And that created a nostalgic yeah. time, a nostalgic moment that we'll all remember. So yeah, I, I do like that. I mean, do you, do you think that there'd be a possibility for Pokemon to hand out their IP to tops and do a tops Chrome set again, you know, do refractors? I, or do you I, think it would destroy them? <laughs> let's put it this way. I don't know. Right. And it's something that I probably shouldn't comment on due to my specific nature and relationship. Understood. Um, because let's just say if I commented that's a good idea mm. or commented there's a bad idea, it's, it's almost like passing judgment on their business practices. Gotcha. What, what I, I just think that they're exceptional at managing their brand. Yeah. I, I've, oh. I really do. And I, and what I have seen from them is that they're so much focused on longevity and they're so focused on the long game mm -hmm. that they're just so trustworthy in that regard mm -hmm. where, you know, whereas I love the manufactured collectability that the sports universe has done tops and those guys have done mm -hmm. because it's all about the chase. It's all about the chase. And if you do get it, you do know that you have something of value. Mm -hmm. So they can manufacture more and just and just have more scarcity in in the in the rare. So Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's a much better system today than it used to be, that's for sure. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a it's a it would definitely be a fun, exciting time, but yeah, I don't know how how reasonable it is for a company like Pokemon to move forward with something like that. So who knows? Maybe one day we'll see it. Um I would be. I would just say that whatever they do, I trust that they do it well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen enough over the years. I've seen them grow up. I've had really an amazing. I didn't even know. I didn't know it was historical. I mm -hmm. didn't know that I was part of something so remarkable. That you know, my <laughs> friends and my the people that that you know helped create this brand. I was interacting with and still do. Like it's it's really cool, man. Like. I now I really appreciate it mm -hmm. and like period, but uh, yeah, yeah, it takes you know, not nothing is uh, legendary until it becomes legendary over time, right? You know, right? So, outside of Pokemon, I mean, you've again, we started buying sports. Uh, I see some Fortnite boxes behind you, I see Rocky, <laughs> yeah. I see uh, Charlie Brown. You got a yeah. little bit of everything. I mean, what's whose shoes are those? Oh, those are Ric Flair, okay. uh, Adidas. They're worth about $100. Okay. There's nothing to this. Nice. Um, but, you know, like, not everything you collect is is because it's got huge secondary market value. Some mm -hmm. things you collect is because it's so cool. Or, like, Ric Flair, like I said, pushed me down when I was 11 years old. I loved him <laughs> ever since. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I collect kind of broadly. I mean, I... Um, but most, most of the things I collect are toys or video games. I mean, toys are cards, mm. although I've recently become interested in the idea of video games, but yeah, you did maybe that. not sealed, maybe not sealed, maybe more like complete in box instead of sealed. Yeah. You did that, uh, Instagram live with, uh, I'm sorry, I Eric his name. Nyerman. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Eric Nyerman. He's a, uh, a dentist and he's actually, he influenced his friends to invest a million dollars into sealed video games in wow. late uh, 2019 before it really took off. And wow. today, I think he's seen a 500% return on his investment. I like to go to that dentist's office, just sealed <laughs> games all around. Like, <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get him to, um, I was just, I was giving him recommendations. I'm a branding guy and I'm like, mm -hmm. listen, you know, you should have, pictures like high res photos of some of these games in your office that you've collected in the in the uh and just put them around your waiting room it would just be so cool yeah i've got so maybe he'll do that i've got one graded game super ah, smash super melee smash, 
and by the way, 9.4, is that a sealed or is that uh, the, complete in box? This is a sealed, this is the original release, and I have a, a bestseller. This, this is the only game that I have, <clears throat> graded at least, because um, it was my favorite of all time from back in the day. So, But of course, it's a, it, it's a big name too, so it definitely has some value behind it. Um, and, and how long ago did you buy that? So I bought, it's funny, I, so I'm good friends with Pokey Rev with Nick. Yeah. And he, he talked to me about video games like two years ago. Like, you got to get in on this. And yeah, um, I just couldn't wrap my head around the feels and understanding and, and just putting my time into learning about all that. And so I never really did. But I caught on to him buying some sealed games from Amazon, which is really odd because you don't get real actual pictures of the item, right? It's just a stock image. Yeah. So I... Two years ago, I bought the only two sealed melees, Super Smash melees on on Amazon, and like two hundred dollars uh, each, two hundred fifty dollars each, which was kind of market price, maybe a little bit lower than eBay for the like the reprint, the bestseller. They both came in, opened the first one, bestseller. Opened the second one, original USA first print. I was just oh ecstatic, God. and you know at the time it was worth twice what I paid, but. Now that I got them graded and they oh. graded beautifully, nine four, nine six, you know, it's it's yeah, it's awesome. yeah, the, it's that's a next level type of return, right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so very happy with that one, and then uh, I've got some backyard baseball lying around as well. This is oh, cool. Pablo Sanchez. He's probably the most uh, one of the greatest athletes of my generation. Just being a, a little kid. Player. I remember. I remember backyard. Yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah, some great stuff. Yeah, some great stuff. Yeah, so it's uh, no, dude. This collecting journey has been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've joined it and, and uh, I guess got your start with Pokemon. And I'm excited to see where, where you're headed. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, uh, listen, I'm, I'm excited about, like I said, continuing to communicate to people that all of their investments don't have to be boring. Mm -hmm and that they can invest in things that they love and that they should invest part of their time professionally also in things that they love. Yeah. Um, and to me, like I said, it doesn't take a hundred percent of your time. You know, you can do 5%. You can, there's, there's a, there is a, there's a way to follow your passions and yeah. that's, that's what this is all about. Yeah. And I'm, I'm living and breathing that right now. It's you are man. It took me four or five years to take that leap. And yeah, it was five. Yeah. Like you said, 5% and it slowly grew, grew, grew. And it's like, I got to go. And here I am. So that's awesome. Um, well, you know, you're, you're going to inspire a lot of people and you'll inspire people that are older than you. You'll inspire people that are your age. And, and most importantly, you'll inspire kids mm -hmm. and uh, it's the kids that matter the most in terms of, you know, shaping our future, right? And so, you know, the idea that kids feel comfortable in their own shoes and they feel comfortable following things that they love and they feel comfortable, you know, that, you know, when I was, I'll tell you this, when I started the toy business 20 plus years ago, um, adult consumers of kids products were considered nerds or fanboys or girls um they were not necessarily catered to mm -hmm. and right off the bat that's exactly who i wanted to talk to and that's what i've done my whole career and um all the way back to my gaming uh yahoo as a search engine and you know it was all about communicating with collectors and uh man it's never failed me. So, mm -hmm. you know, dedicating uh, some of my time to communicating with collectors today um, is an awesome use of time. I love it. Great. Well, before we go, can you snag yeah. that Dragon Ball Z figure, the show of the world, or is yeah. that secret for, for just me? It's not secret. <laughs> not secret. Um, I will go get it. I don't know if, if dead air is good, but you could. I can, uh, you I can, can always, always cut. Yeah, I can always I, cut right it out. Back. Awesome. I'll be right back.
Okay. So this was, uh, <clears throat> I'm back. All right. So this was, I guess it was February 2004, and it was 2004 Toy Fair in New York. Oh, wow. With the free chibi. With the free chibi. Jax 2004 Vegeta from the Frieza Saga. $2.99 value. Look at that. <laughs> that's, so that's one of 100, you said? Yeah, this is a, this is a one of a hundred, and and my guess is, okay. you know, at the time at the time Dragon Ball didn't really have collector appeal or value, mm -hmm. like, nor you know Pokemon really didn't at that time mm -hmm. very much either. I mean, it was very limited. It was more kids, mm -hmm. and uh, I would say that of the hundred, eighty five of them were probably opened up or <laughs> thrashed. Wow! So if if there are ten of those still floating around, I'd be shocked. And I'll show you another. And this is another one that, that oh, this, this is, is sort of, this is the grail. And this one's in absolutely perfect condition. Oh yeah, I that's the one. Bug. Okay. But it's, you can tell it's pristine. Now, I have to ask this. Is there actually only 25? Yeah. You didn't, there's no yes. extra copies floating around. No. Like the illustrators, there's no extra copies. Okay. No, 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 not at all. I mean, honestly, if you put a number on something that's Pokemon, uh, you better you, you better live up to it. Yeah. Um, but on that one, I bet you there's not more than six or seven that have survived. Okay. I, I'd be shocked if there were. Wow. Um, because I can tell you at the meeting itself, um, they were just left in their chairs or they were opened up on site. Cool. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, don't do it. It's like I can barely look at people. I'm like, ah. It's like you know, uh, you know, I I I ended up um, basically putting mine like under my arm and walking out of the room. Uh -huh. Like I will never ever throw this away. <laughs> you guys trash the prototypes and all that, or is that secret? <laughs> no, um, I've done. I've got a really good track record of not keeping prototypes. Good. Um, That's good. Yeah. It's good and bad. Yeah. Because the truth is, 10 years later, no one cares. But I just didn't feel good about it. I've got a couple, but those were specifically gifted to me. Okay. And um, that's, that's, when I, that's when I'll hold on to one. Yeah. It's always a, uh, a iffy thing. You know, always, you know, we saw the prototype Blastoise sell at Inheritance Auctions for oh. 360 grand. And, uh, Amazing. I, it's great to have. I, I think it's great to have some of that stuff around, obviously, for historic reasons and just another chase obviously you know so that's that's always pretty cool but, i think uh, i think i have i think i have the coolest nba prototype card oh yeah in the, history of the world and that jordan lebron right it's the jordan braun it's it's an insane card it truly is essentially it's you know you can see it on my instagram at jeremy mm -hmm. Pedauer, but it's on one side it's jordan it's it's lebron's rookie year and my working theory, because it's been authenticated and I'm actually friendly with the Upper Deck guys too, and my working theory is that this is the very first LeBron card in that it was a prototype like the Blastoise, mm -hmm. but they didn't have enough imagery, so they just overlaid Jordan. And they've got Jordan's name, and on the back it's all Jordan. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah, I mean... That, a conversation that's un, like unavoidable with that is is it's too good to be true <laughs> i mean that's yeah that's but yeah that's an awesome piece man that's really cool authentication is really mm. important yeah and uh getting the authentication um was very meaningful mm -hmm. on that card let's put it that way have you have you shared the story of how you got that and saved it no, I, you know, I, I will say it was very opportunistic. Mm -hmm. um, it was a situation where a friend of mine was like, hey, we can get this card. Do you want it? And I was like, um, yes, you don't have to ask me <laughs> twice. Yeah. I was like, that one day could be very, very valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I was like, the only thing I ask is that I put it in a vault mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where I keep my expensive stuff. And, uh, and that was that. So, so what's your favorite piece? Last, last question. What, what's, what's your favorite piece in your collection? The Ric you know, Flair they, shoes? 
<laughs> no, it, it changes. It, it's day to day, you know? Yeah. I mean, some days it's one thing, other days, I think right now, just because we just talked about it. Oops. Sorry about that. No worries. I have uh, 650 people that work with me. So there's plenty of uh, opportunity for phone calls. Yeah. But um, what I think right now, probably my favorite, just because we just talked about it, is the 1973 Jack Nicholas Panini, one of four. The population is only a four, PSA 10. Mm -hmm. It is a magnificent card. It's his rookie. It's uh, an absolutely gorgeous, unbelievable, shocking card. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one that I paid $20,000 for, and I really believe... Um, that was before golf really took off at all. And I really believe that's like a, it's like a Pele type card mm -hmm. in that, you know, you saw what happened on rally with Pele or you, maybe you did, but it's like, you know, I mean, that Pele card is now three, four, five hundred thousand dollar card. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I believe this Jack is going to be going in that same direction. And I, I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah. I would not be shocked. So, uh, that's pretty awesome. Well, Thank you, Jeremy. I really do appreciate the time you gave me today. I know My you're... pleasure, man. This was a blast. I'm more than honored to be here with you, and uh, I really appreciate everything you do for the community, and, and congratulations on all of your success. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, hopefully continue it all together. We're all, we're all having a, a, a great year, I think, coming up with 2021. So uh, be sure everybody follow Jeremy Padauer here on Instagram. Are you starting a YouTube or anything soon? You got any announcements? No, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm going to be doing more on TikTok. Okay. Um, I've got a huge announcement coming up on an acquisition that I made, okay. um, not Pokemon, uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and it will change the face of a category. It really will. Um, it is a big deal. I will tell you off camera okay. right after this. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, be sure to follow them. Uh, thank you again so much. And uh, if you have any Pokemon questions, feel free to hit me up and, and uh, you know, I'll take care of you. So thank you. Thanks again. Have a good one.